Welcome to another WMUG interview. My name is Robert Marshall, ECM MVP and Community Leader at the Windows Management User Group. And today I have uh, another interviewee, Peter Edgerton, and I'm going to hand over straight away and start the questions. So Peter, who are you and what is your role? Hi Rob. Um, so as you said, my, my name is Peter Edgerton. Um, I'm a System Centre Consultant for a company in the UK called Inform Unlimited. Uh, and also in my spare time, I'm a community leader with WMUG. Oh, great. What exactly does a, a system center consultant do? Okay, so my, my role primarily um, is, face, is, is based around designing and implementing <coughs> solutions based on Microsoft System Center 2012 R2 Configuration Manager and all the technologies that lie around that. And also operations manager is another of my um, subjects that I cover off. So I travel up and down the UK visiting um, customers, designing solutions based on those technologies and, and as I say, implementing them uh, and obviously some troubleshooting that also goes alongside that too. A whole range essentially, a proper, yeah. a proper roaming consultant or mobile yeah. consultant. Get involved in everything. You must be on the move quite often. Yeah, it's um, I guess as uh, as well as most other consultants out there, you you travel quite a bit. Obviously, you just go where the customers are, so um, you can be spending quite a bit of time in hotels. Just part of the job, really. So um, there's good sides to it and there's bad sides to it. Hmm. But it is the consultant role exactly. So, how did you become a community leader? So a community leader um, came about because I contacted the guys at WMUG. Um, I was interested in getting involved in assisting the community, doing things like blogging and getting involved with organising events and things like that, um, just to see what I could do to contribute to the IT and specifically the system centre community. Um, cause it's something I've obviously used over the years as um, someone starting out and getting getting good at what I do. Um, so it kind of seems seems only right that I should try and give something back a bit. I, I remember when you approached us uh, to join, and uh, it, was, it, it was really nice to bring you on board. Um, and since you've come on board, we've we've done lots of things with new initiatives. Uh, such as, uh, do you want to run, I don't want to steal your thunder, but we've come up with some interesting stuff. Do you want to run through that for the audience, Peter? What yeah, WMUG we'll, is up to? Yeah, well, we've obviously done um, a few physical events that uh, involve Wally Mead most of the time as well. Um, he comes over from the US and, and shows us the, um, the sort of presentations that you might get from TechEd and the like and MMS, that kind of thing. Uh, we also get involved in online events, whether that be uh, just an hour or a bit longer, where we can particular aspects of um, vendor products, things like that. Mm -hmm. And we're recently doing something called Config Manager Clinics, and we're going to uh, expand that into other areas of System Center as well, which is essentially just a, a Q&A type session where um, the the general public, if you like, can submit some questions into us, and we'll we line up essentially a panel of, uh, of of experts and industry leaders who can hopefully try and address those questions and, and problems that people have got. We had one of those recently, didn't we, last week? Uh, a couple of weeks back, sorry. Uh, yeah. Our first uh, one, which, uh, which, which was Config Manager, and uh, we've got another one lined up. Uh, I believe that is the Operations Manager one. Yeah, we're going to do the Ops Manager hopefully in the next uh, next few weeks. Um, we've got a couple of people lined up for that. We should be pretty good, um, good people to, to speak to. Mm. And also we plan on doing another Config Manager one as soon as we can, can fit that in, really. Um, again, we've got some pretty good guys who will be available on that one. We, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll put the, the events on the events page and if you if you keep an eye on the WMUG Twitter feed, you'll see us announcing those ahead of time, so you'll be able to register and, and attend. Uh, but we're trying to keep these informal, aren't we, really? We don't want these things to be formal. We just want it to be a nice, relaxed hour of chat um, covering a subject uh, that, we you know, uh, that we rotate through, you know, rotate through subjects. So 
Um, yeah, for, yeah. For, for me, it's the, it's the sort of format of a traditional user group, if you like. Mm -hmm. Obviously, life doesn't always lend itself to you being in uh, in the same place uh, one one night of an e you know one evening in a week or something like that. So mm. um, we generally do these things over a link call because obviously people are all over, and we, we get get people from all over the world con uh, joining in and contributing. So mm. it, it works well. Uh, we had someone from America on, on, our, on our last one, uh, giving us some great uh, information on on their experiences with deploying uh, distribution points uh, on secondaries and stuff like that, which got got a really good conversation going, didn't it? Um, yeah, yeah, it so, helps everybody. Yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to to to, to see more of those. Um, yeah, um, so as a community leader, you're. Um, your your blogging and attending physical events, helping put on basically just helping um, WMUG produce material for the community. Uh, and yeah. and what we don't do is we we're we're, we're non-commercial, not for profit. So we're just trying to do this in, in our voluntary time. And uh, so things are you know so they they're not as fast as they would be if it was a commercial company or commercial exactly. organisation. Yeah, we but we get there in the end, don't we? <laughs> We're real people with real lives, and yeah. uh, as, a, as a reflection, we we can blog about real real life things and real things that we come across in our day to day working lives. So it's um, yeah, it's it's all it's good an, stuff. That we it's put an up easy there. way to to give back, especially as you as you said, if you started off life uh, uh, building up your knowledge by by tapping the community, which uh, most of us do. Um, yeah, gets to a point where uh, you're taking less in and giving more back. Um, exactly. Yeah. So, so, so I'm going to move it on. So what, what is coming back to the consultancy, um, Peter, uh, what is the best thing about working as a consultant? And I asked that because you mentioned one thing and that was mobility. And I was wondering if you wanted to just cover that off uh, as an aspect of being a consultant. Yeah, well, as I say, I travel all over the UK from uh, top to bottom, Scotland, uh, England, Ireland, Wales, everything. So uh, the, the good side to that is Obviously, you get to see different customers in different types of businesses with different environments from large to small. So I think probably the smallest I've done is maybe um, an CCM implementation with 500 machines, something like that. Mm -hmm. A job that I did last year, which was scaling up to something like 19,000 machines. So as you can imagine, there's, there's many differences between mm -hmm. um, those environments and those organizations. and each customer seems to want something ever so slightly different. So I always find that whichever job you go to, there's always something new and something different. So mm -hmm. it's um, it's really good exposure mm -hmm. and uh, something I can use to obviously expand my knowledge and share that with uh, with you guys out there. Mm -hmm. I found uh, one of the only disadvantages of being a consultant, as long as you're just accepting that you're going to have to be mobile, is that uh, often enough you don't see anything fully through because you're you come in, you do, you leave. So it's not like you could be there for the entire length of a, a life cycle of a hierarchy, for example, which a lot of admins uh, that are embedded consultants or contractors or permanent staff get. They get that kind of closure, whereas we're just moving around, implementing and walking away uh, most of the time. Um, yeah, that's that's true. I've, I'd probably say I've done I've done my first year of uh, centre admin work in the past, so and that's what essentially led me on. So. Um, Obviously, we try and we try and put it in and hand over to the guys so that they they got a good idea of what they're doing once we've left the place. Okay, so moving on, um, how do you see the IT community, Peter? Okay, yeah, well, as as I said before, so starting out, and I'm sure everyone can uh, can sort of agree with this. You generally, if you don't know something, the first place and you, the first place you go is is your favourite search engine, whether that be obviously Google or Bing or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it kind of it kind of seems right that you should, once you've got to a certain level and you can start writing about things, that you should probably give a little bit back, so then you know other people can can get up to speed with things like that. So especially in the system center community and, and SCCM specifically, there's so much going on out there in terms of um, community, people sharing new things and utilities. Mm -hmm. um, you've written a few utilities as well that you, you can find on WMOG and, you know, there's, <clears throat> there's companies that 
they're giving away free things and scripts that people are writing and there's, there's all sorts going on out there so that sort of spirit if you like of the community is, mm -hmm. is, is alive and well so it's good to be involved with it really I'm finding that uh, that traditional I'm, I'm calling that the traditional community and the the very latest change is for me is using Twitter to continue that community it's a conversation essentially and I tweet a lot now and there's a lot of people following me and we have interesting conversations and these people are, are all around the world um, which is just something we just couldn't do until we had all this fancy IT up here you know the internet and everything but it, not only does it break down borders it kind of creates them because we can't fit we don't often want to physically meet because it's easier to do it virtually um, but yeah. but but that aside um, I found Twitter has actually become quite um, I suppose um, useful for, for continuing the, 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 the community conversation that I have or, or I take up do you find yeah, the same? yeah I definitely agree with you so I spend uh, whatever time I can really on Twitter I, I tend to follow a lot of other um, community contributors and community leaders and sort of experts in, in the fields that I work in so mm. and as I say there's a lot of people sharing a lot of good stuff out there so it's if you want to try and further educate yourself and you know get get good at what you're doing then it's definitely a good place to to go and, and get information from mm. without a doubt mm. I keep an eye on a few hashtags like config manager SECM a few others and uh, that brings me a lot of content, a lot of information just to pour over, you know. It keeps me abreast of most things because people are writing their content on their traditional mediums and blogs and such like, and then tweeting that out so you get to see, you know, you get to see those hashtags, it's pulling it all in. So that Twitter has really actually changed community for me or the way that I can get a broader, more overarching view of what's happening without visiting dozens and dozens of websites, you know, or having to choose a few. That I keep an eye on. Now I can just use Twitter to kind of uh, filter down the noise, but uh, keep me in touch with what's happening, what's yeah. what's being you know what's being spoken about, the problems that in my area with Config Manager, but well, it's very useful. Yeah, you can even use um, sort of aggregators and things like TweetDeck and Hootsuite, which will, if you're not familiar with, can obviously you can list multiple Twitter accounts and you can list multiple sort of feeds in one window if you like so it's something I use as well because I, I do some of the WMUG um, tweeting as well as my own account so I talk in the third I talk in a connect, disconnected sense because I'm just trying to be the interviewer not not a guy that's being semi-interviewed but yeah I'm, I'm doing this along with you so you know we're managing that that tweet account I've just found something really great on but it's, it's for pay you have to pay for it on the Android Play Store called Phoenix F E NIX, Phoenix for Twitter, and that allows me to do everything you were saying there about managing multiple accounts and and uh, very similar to TweetDeck. But um, yeah. Yeah. So Peter, what technology interests you? Well, it's um, I think to be honest, it's something that's not to everyone's taste really, but I'm quite interested in wearable technology. Um, I know a lot of people pretty much just. Uh, disregard it as, as a non-starter but some aspects of it are quite like the, the thoughts of so watches is something I'm quite interested in for um, you know reading emails and even doing things like Twitter and Facebook and other social media things like that it just mm. it just takes it that little bit step further so for example if I'm um, carrying around my two mobile phones so I have my personal mobile phone and my work mobile phone I can aggregate things on my uh, watch if I want to and just check my emails and mm. you know if one's in my bag and one's in my pocket you know mm. you know fumbling around so I like the idea of things like that so I'm, I'm always on the lookout for a good uh, Windows phone compatible watch at the moment because th there's one or two out there but for me they're not quite there mm. um, but some of the some of the other stuff that's available for Android for example the, you know the Pebble and uh, even some of the old Sony ones, you can do a lot. Of, you can do a lot of good stuff with them. So it's something that I'm quite interested in, and I'll, uh, I'll be keeping an eye on that a bit further. It's uh, a very new, new market opening up there, isn't it? Really, and I was just thinking to myself, what would be the end of that market? What would be the 
ultimate culmination. I suppose that would be everything happening inside your retina or projected onto your retina so that you don't have to use any user interface on any device. It's kind of there. Um, that would be yeah. kind of where it all ends. But before it, that happens, we're going to have a whole plethora, you know, the whole wide spectrum of different wearable gadgets. Um, the, like, the, like the materials they're looking at for producing um, energy so that you can charge the battery and and uh, making everything flexible so that you can weave it into fabrics. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the uh, possibilities are limited really by, by what you can think up, to be honest. Are you going to go as far as Professor Kevin Warwick over at Reading University, uh, England? <laughs> He's uh, started embedding stuff into his body to get a little bit step yeah, further, is. isn't he? You know him, yeah. It I've heard of that. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's probably a little bit too far for me to be. Yeah. <laughs> we should tweet. You should tweet him and tell him he's a little bit too radical. <laughs> to stop it. <laughs> yeah, especially visiting customer sites. I don't want a new pass every time I uh, attend yeah. a customer site. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He'd be a bit like Picard from Star Trek, you know, after he's been borged out, you know, things sticking out of his eyes and stuff. Yeah, I don't think customers are really ready for that yet. But Pete, you stay with it, man, because. Wearable, wearable IT is the future. It's the way that we're going. Uh, ultimately, we don't want to be wearing or holding. Uh, the whole concept of holding solid devices in our pockets is going to be obsoleted eventually by all of this stuff. It's an interesting subject. So, uh, what is the funniest thing you've been asked to do in IT okay. or, or you know, related IT yeah. related? <clears throat> I, was tr I was trying to think of a, a good example for this. I've been I've been working in IT for about 14 years now so a lot of that time has been sent, spent as well in, in sort of system support and, and I'm sure a lot of the people who, who listen to this will be able to relate to working in system support you get all sorts of odd queries and questions and things like that uh, not necessarily related they should be doing but probably the one that stands out as a, a slightly oddball one was um, going back a few years now I used to work for an, a company that produced um, sort of heavy duty lead acid batteries and in the factory um, we had some computers and because of the harsh environment after a short time a number of machines that got put in there started to sort of rust and degrade um, so <laughs> a few times we had to go in and the solution that we came up with for these common components that were failing were, was to uh, to lubricate them with some, some some vaseline or something like that, so that was like a you know a two weekly visit over to the to the factory to to lubricate a few components, which is a pretty unusual one I think. I've never heard of anything like it. That's, that's <laughs> just so out there, but that is super cool. You know what that reminds me of? That reminds me of that kind of lateral thinking from the Apollo 13 movie where the you know. What do we do? We need something right away. Um, <laughs> lube. <laughs> it's it's one of the, the cheapest, silliest solution. But I bet that was pretty effective, wasn't it? I bet that did hold yeah, back the the uh, asset dep depreciation. <laughs> yeah, it certainly did the trick. It prolonged the life of the machines no end. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, it kept the kept the bean counters quite happy. Well, thank you for sharing that story. It was a very interesting one. I, I've heard a few on these interviews, but that ranks as high as as funny as. So, who do you think? Uh, sorry, what do you think is the hottest product or utility in the Windows management space? Well, again, it's something I had to give a little bit of thought to because there's so many utilities out there based around what I do. There's a lot of different components of Config Manager and things like that, but. Probably the conclusion that I came to is got to be PowerShell to me. Um, there's so much I know um, in terms of Power Grips and PowerShell based utilities that a lot of the system set of suite you can control, not quite 100%, but you can control most of it through PowerShell, which gives you obviously a lot of opportunity and a lot of um, sort of possibilities in terms of what you can do with the products and it can obviously make someone like me my life a lot easier and you know help implement things a lot quicker when you're working with customers who might have slightly different environments and you know it helps you get the job done a lot more efficiently so yeah it's, it's got to be it's got to be PowerShell really it's, it's pretty awesome oh yeah 
I think that's a good choice, a good choice indeed. Um, it's very appealing right now. It, it reminds me of something I've seen in my own lifetime, and it doesn't make me an expert at all of this stuff or or able to prophesize, you know, what's, where everything's going. But um, I saw exactly the same trend with VB script when we switched from batch in, in a command interpreted environment over to using VB script, and um, its take up was was slow. Uh, because it wasn't built into the OS at the time when it was released, uh, VB script, you had to install it. Um, but then when it was built into the OS, there was huge take up, and that became the, the de facto glue, infrastructure glue, or gluing script. Um, and a couple of years ago, I was talking to good friends of mine that are into their PowerShell, and I was saying that, you know, I, I will switch to fully writing PowerShell when it's pervasive. Um, you know, aside from the fact that it's the best thing since you know sliced bread, and whatnot, yeah. it's it needed to be pervasive. If I leave it with a customer, it's not just that the customer might be new to it and but receptive to it. It's whether or not they've got the skills in there to support what I leave behind. And what I find is that it's a mixed bag. I find people that are you know heavy duty VB scripters and they can switch over and manage the PowerShell pretty much enough but they haven't spent much time there you know so I'm not leaving them in a too fragile situation but a while ago a few years ago it, it was it was a completely different landscape PowerShell was a, a conversation a lot of IT guys were just having I wasn't finding an immense amount of PowerShellers but in the last few years I just say last two years I might be wrong it might be a bit longer now there's been massive uptake and now if you just look at the PowerShell community there's there's an immense amount of programmers shifted over to that space or popped out of nowhere uh, grown up I suppose the next generation and PowerShell has become uh, a really exciting topic people are making massive uh, impact by using it like the system center product range is now I don't know what percentage you called out 70% or but mostly PowerShell ready um, yeah which is a, incredible when you think about the the potential that you can automate the in almost most of the system center range yeah just with as PowerShell. I say, it opens up lots of sort of opportunities um, and it introduces this this role that's referred to as DevOps, so mm -hmm. the, the, the traditional ops guy can do a bit of dev and mm -hmm. it sort of bridges the gap really. So. Mm -hmm. and many years ago you used to have these DevOps in, in uh, back in the old mainframe days, um, operators yeah. a little bit more savvier with the command line and stuff like that and it looks like it's going back that way, at least enabling via PowerShell. But to just finish off what I was saying, it had to be pervasive and I'm I'm kind of now getting to the point where I'm thinking yes it's ready, uh, PowerShell is practically almost everywhere. All the offices that are being released have PowerShell built in properly now. We're up to version 3. Um, everybody's talking and using about uh, talking about PowerShell and using it now. It's the thing that I'll switch over. So I stopped writing VB script um, I've put that to bed, and now I'm only ever going to write glue scripts in PowerShell, uh, which is quite an, an epoch for me, a big time change, a change really. Just like retiring our XP, um, yeah, it's a milestone. I'm I'm now talking about I I'm after all these years, you know, I've been using PowerShell pretty pretty hardcore. I, I'm I'm parking that, putting that out to pasture. It's yes. time. PowerShell's here. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely the way forward for now. Yeah. Well, I know uh, a PowerShell MVP that would be quite happy with that, Kato, that, that I said that, because I stood in front of him telling him that PowerShell wasn't ready, and I don't <laughs> think he really got that I meant that it wasn't pervasive. He thought probably that I was uh, knocking it. But, um, okay, so if you weren't a consultant, what kind of non-IT job would you like to do? What would I like to do? Well, I, I'm quite into my... Um to my, my cars and my driving, that kind of thing, so that's something I enjoy and I've done a few sort of driving experiences and mm -hmm. I went go-karting recently as well, so things like that I'm, I, I enjoy a lot, so hopefully, although there is a name, I do have a namesake rally driver who's got exactly the same name as me. Oh, really? So there's some competition, but yeah, um, but yeah some, uh, I, I love the idea of being a, some sort of racing driver or something like that, mm -hmm. that'd be pretty cool. So what kind of racing appeals to you? Is it? It's obviously road racing, not not oval, NASCAR, or any of that stuff. Yeah, no, I'm not really into the oval. Although you know, 
I'll, I'll give anything a go. I've, I've done a bit of rallying. I think that's probably the most difficult, to be honest, from I've done track, track yeah. driving. Um, and as I say, go-karting. I like go-karting yeah. just for the, the pure fun aspect of it. Yeah. And, you know, and it's, it's a sort of accessibility to, to most people. I, I, it's very accessible as long as you're, uh, um, you haven't got a bad back or anything. Then you, yeah. Or, or, or you're, you're, you're at the extreme scale of one thing, height or sight width. But yeah, um, I actually did a rally uh, day as well, and and that was really demanding. I, I, I really enjoyed it as well. They had really muddied the place up. Um, so when we went around, there was big swathes of mud waves flying everywhere and um, I, I managed to do a complete spin but stay in the same spot it's, it's almost <laughs> the kind of moving forward but the instructor it was hilarious because he st turned to the side and me said nice spin <laughs> and I'd managed to get it back in gear and off we went you know it didn't feel terribly smooth but uh, for someone that just got in the ready car I just pulled off a trick you know um, completely unintentional yeah I'll, I'll, I'll make note but um, Road racing or, or road days is something that I haven't done yet, and that really does interest me because I I am I consider myself into driving, although nothing more than amateur, and I have not driven for races outside of go karting, but I would like to do a track day. Um, yeah. Do you want to talk about your track day a little bit more? We've got a few yeah. more minutes before we need to wrap up. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I've done a I've done a couple of track days. Um, based at Rockingham, Rockingham Racetrack, uh, which is near Corby in the UK. So that's a little bit of a track for me, but it's a, it's a really, really good track um, for, you know, racing things like Ferraris and Aston Martins and mm -hmm. Atoms, things like that, um, mm -hmm. Caterhams even. Mm -hmm. So I, I sort of got involved with it a little bit from my brother as well, who's really into building cars and things like that. So he's... he's um, built a lot of seven replica so i've been to quite a few uh shows and things like that with him mm. so um yeah it's kind of in the family in that respect Told my dad not the most exciting job but he was a driving instructor so i was brought up driving from a very young age so i was taught to drive very very young mm. um so yeah it's something that it's i really in, enjoy it's in your blood yeah you could say that I was just thinking to make a joke about and drive and instructing for you, but I was putting it together in my head, but I don't think I can. <laughs> um, yeah, um, yeah. so driving, yeah, and go-karting, you, you said that you went recently, and uh, that's something that I, I've had to put on hold just at the moment because I haven't got enough time for it, uh, but I have a place that's nearby, it's about a one-hour drive each way, uh, called Buckmore yeah. Park, and it's a 1200 meter international trek. And they do all kinds of events there. And one that appealed to me, and I started getting into, was one called um, the Iron Man. And it wasn't to do with strength and such thing. It was just endurance, really. So it was a one-hour drive on the on on this 1,200-meter track, um, coming up to the time uh, when it gets dark. Um, and it's nice. you know you had 20 plus people on there, it's, it, and it was very competitive. Um, I started getting into it. You see that progress that you begin making, and that makes you go back again, you know, or, or it did for me. Um, yeah. but but that kind of stopped while I haven't got time for doing that to drive all over there over that uh, that way and uh, put in any driving instead I I put some driving in at home I've got this racing simulator online called iRacing yeah. and I've got a pretty good uh, set of pedals and wheel and sequential shifter and I have a little play around but, so virtually I drive all kinds of fancy cars and high speed stuff uh, but the one that appeals to me the most is uh, the one that I have the most fun with is a thing called the Skip Barber um, which is a Formula 2000 car get up to 135 miles in it it's a two liter engine it, it's, it's quite a nice little drive quite grippy uh, all the way up to things like the Williams Toyota Formula 1 uh, car which is just just insane grip and uh, it, when you drive these things, and this is why I was bringing this up, uh, I, I thought maybe you would agree with me, is that um, when you've done those kind of things, you know, driven at speed on a track, uh, which I haven't done uh, myself, but I've done it virtually, you kind of get an, a, an appreciation of what those Formula One guys are doing in the car, Definitely. you know, and how that several hour race or you know, hour and a half race or whatever, what that really takes. Um, 
Yeah, yeah. So driving up and down the M6 and the M1 and such like <laughs> is uh, is one thing, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, like you say, especially when you you go karting because there's, there's so much sort of strength involved as well, trying to get yeah. thing around corners. But yeah, it, as you say, it does give you an appreciation of driving these things at you know up to 200 mile an hour or whatever sort of speeds they go at. It's uh, it, it be the easiest job in the world, I'm sure. I, I think you'd have to be super fit as well as. Uh have reflexes that are just out out there alien yeah. as they call it um, but um yeah maybe uh maybe one day you could be the next middle aged maybe a middle aged lewis hamilton <laughs> yeah. yeah i think i'll probably miss my chance now i better stick yeah. with it <laughs> yeah that's what i thought actually <laughs> i laughed with because that's exactly how it was if i if i had have got into driving at an early age i don't think i would have let let took my foot off of that to be honest with you um, there you go. But uh, yeah. Peter, it's been a pleasure interviewing you. Uh, thank you very much for your time. That's all right, no problem. And um, good luck with your week uh, and, and, and the job and all. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you.